Thanks for hopping on and tuning in. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Mason Phipps. Um, I'm the director of the North Carolina Marine and Estuary Foundation. And um, you know, if you haven't heard of us, um, I'm based in Raleigh. Um, and you know, we represent uh, all of our coastal communities here in North Carolina. And um, you know, I've been with NCMEF for about a year now, and it's been a, been a great pleasure, um, not only learning about all that we have on our coast here in the state, but also about other states and um, getting to know the BTT team. Um, and before we get started, I just want to thank them, Jim McDuffie, President and CEO. Thanks for, you know, partnering up with us on this project, as well as BTT's marketing director, uh, Nick Roberts. Nick, thanks for all your help with this. And I you know, really appreciate both of y'all, you know, connecting with me and, and um, introducing me to Dr. Adams and Lucas Griffin here. Um, because, you know, we've got a really, really, uh, you know, interesting presentation ahead. And if you're on this call, chances are you're not only a fisherman, but you're actually interested in, you know, bettering the fishery um, and educating yourself. So uh, if you're on here, thank you. You know, again, I'm, I'm sure we're all kind of tired of webinars after last year, but um, I think you'll really enjoy this one. So um, we'll try and keep it quick to the point. I realize it's late in the day, but we're glad you're on. Um, also, if you have any questions during the webinar, um, please drop anything down into the Q and A at the bottom, and I'll try and direct them to you know Dr. Adams or Luke, or if, if there's anything you have a question about in my presentation, um, please just drop it down in the bottom, and, and we'll get to it. Um, so just a little bit about um, you know the North Carolina Marine and Estuary Foundation. So we were formed in 2017. Uh, by a group of you know like-minded anglers that kind of saw a need to fill information gaps um, for the state um, and to educate both the public and policymakers of the challenges and uh, certain things that are um, you know disrupting the condition of our fishery. So what they did was they formed NCMEF um, in hopes to generate, you know, science-based research that leads to positive outcomes um, for the coastal resources, habitats, and, you know, certain fin fish and crustacean species. So uh, we've come a long way. We're still obviously um, in the building process, but, um, you know, if you haven't checked out our website, I'd encourage you to check us out again. We're building that up, so um, we have hopes of you know adding a lot to it. We just got it rolled out last year, so but um, you know there's a lot on there about us that I won't get to today. But again, any questions you have, please drop it into the bottom, and um, glad to get to it at the end. Um, so last year, like I had mentioned, we, we conducted a study um, and it wasn't only specifically focused on North Carolina. It was actually focused on all 23 coastal states um, as they govern, you know, near shore fisheries. So it was a three pronged approach. Um, and as you can see, we had uh, kind of, we had different researchers working on different uh, focal areas. Um, but for today, we're really focused on the left side of what you see here, and that's the marine fisheries habitat best management practices. Um, and that was conducted by Dr. Joel Fodger and Dr. Chris Bailey, and they did an incredible job, you know, compiling this data into, um, you know, condensed tables. It was such a challenge, um, you know, and, and I hope this, uh, what I'm about to show you makes sense, um, but it was, I think the we, going into it, we thought that this had been done before. Done before. Um, we found out it really hadn't, or at least hadn't been put in a way that was easily digestible and kind of in layman terms for people to get an idea of not only their state, but surrounding states and, um, you know, of certain regions. So um, the next graph or the next slide I want to show you this is of game fish designations. So uh, along the top of this graph, you can see that we have uh, certain fin fish species, uh, many of which a lot of us probably pursue uh, in our state or other states uh, recreationally. And um, along the left side of this table, what you have is like I mentioned, the 23 coastal states responsible 
for governing, you know, uh, marine fisheries and habitat. Um, so in looking at this, you can see tarpon um, near the uh, end, vertically on the right side, all the way down, um, you know, several game fish designations and catch and release designations. And before I, I continue on, I just want to kind of explain those. So a game fish designation um, is put in place and usually administered on a legislative level. And uh, that prevents a species from being exploited by uh, the commercial fishery and thus harvested to a recreational uh, limit. So not to be confused with catch and release designation. Now catch and release designation is actually um, something that is put in place for um, species that are not meant for the table, right? Like, like tarpon or bonefish. Um, and um, they're, they're more put on the, the recreational angler, obviously, as they are not, you know, seeked or sought after by commercial fishermen. Um, so the catch and release designation is, is also largely important because sometimes here in North Carolina until recently, which I'll get to, you know, an angler, a recreational angler could keep one tarpon, which um, I don't know about you, but, you know, I don't think that tarpon are something you really want to bring home for the family for the table. A great fish on hook and line, tremendous fight, incredible, you know, runs, but, um, you know, pretty bony. Um, here in Virginia, uh, or back in Virginia, I would, you know, fish for shad a lot. And as a kid, I always tried to, I tried many times to figure out a way to you know eat those and not that this is a very close comparison but uh you know I was talking to Dr. Adams and, and shad and, and tarpon kind of similar you know they're just they're just a bony fish so no reason to, that that should have been in place in North Carolina um so on May 23rd as you can see I've highlighted North Carolina here uh May 23rd um amendment 15a uh, 03 and 0509 officially made tarpon a catch and release fish in the state of North Carolina. And now before that, North Carolina didn't have neither a game fish designation or a catch and release designation. So that was a, that was a big win uh, for the state and for the fishery as a whole. Um, and, you know, uh, for the exception of Louisiana now, um, the entire Gulf of Mexico region and the entire Southeast region has either a game fish designation or a catch and release designation in place. So when we take a national look at um, a tarpon and what we've highlighted in yellow here, you can, you can get an idea of, of kind of where we're going. Um, again, Louisiana still yet to lock in a game fish designation or a catch and release designation, but you know, it was, it's our hope that we can get there. Um, and I hope that a table like this um, may educate even their policymakers that, okay, you know, every state above us has done this, so why not us? Um, and the same could be said for Maryland. Now, as you know, during the summer when the tarpon migrates and is starting to migrate more with climate, um, you may see a couple of tarpon reach as far as Maryland. So, um, you know, I can't speak for their legislators, obviously, but again, I. I hope this information is helpful moving forward. Um, we certainly, you know, certainly open our eyes and um, I hope it opens others, other, uh, others eyes. So I um, hope y'all enjoyed this again. You know, this is one table of many that we covered in that research study last year. Um, others included things such as quotas and um, commercial gear prohibitions, um, and, and many other topics. So if you're interested to gain some of that in a, in a format like this, where you can see, you know, maybe your state and the surrounding states, please um, reach out to me or the foundation or, or drop a question down in the q and um, Glad to share it. We're, we'll be, you know, disseminating it all soon here in North Carolina, but um, obviously we'd love to get it in the hands of anyone who's interested. We're you know, we're here to educate people and um, we hope people are interested. And if you're on this call again, you're probably interested. So um, that's, you know, that's kind of all I have. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak before you. And um, I will now turn it over to BTT's Director of Science and Conservation, Dr. Aaron Adams.
Thanks, Mason. Um, let's see, get a screen share going here. All right. So um, I'm joined here by uh, Luke Griffin, uh, Dr. Luke Griffin, who's a colleague at the University of Massachusetts, who's done a lot of this work. Um, and so he's on the call for a question and answer uh, when I'm done going through, giving you guys an idea of, of what the tarpon tracking um, program has been all about. But the take home message, as you can see here on the opening slide, is it's all about a shared fishery. Um, it's not just if you fish in North Carolina, you also have to be concerned about what's going on in other states from Maryland all the way around um, through Texas, because uh, a lot of these fish are connected that way. So the first thing I want to do though was run through the tarpon life cycle um, because a lot of people aren't familiar with it. The, this is a picture of some a group of small group of tarpon uh, pushing across some, uh, sand flats in South Florida. Um, and these are the big fish, you know, 70, 80, 90 pounds that we typically think about as, as anglers. But there's a lot more to it than that. Um, so a lot of people are familiar with daisy chains. Um, this is, you can see the fly line uh, with the fly somewhere in that daisy chain. And among other uh, reasons, we think that the daisy chain behavior um, could be a, a pre-spawning type of behavior. We see this a lot during the spawning season often before the moon's going to go offshore to spawn, which I'll talk about in a second. But they can also daisy chain if there's predators around or if they're on a, a track moving along the beach and they kind of run into an obstruction like a jetty or something. Sometimes they'll daisy chain until they get their bearings and then head off in a different direction. But um, we often see um, some very large fish in these daisy chains during the spawning season. So we think of uh, tarpon as a coastal fish, um, but uh, they also go offshore. The blue ovals here on this uh, figure show uh, likely spawning locations for tarpon. Um, we've, uh, colleagues have used uh, satellite uh, tags in the past to track tarpon. Uh, they've also looked for uh, tiny baby tarpon larvae, uh, and they found those larvae and some um, interesting behaviors in these locations offshore. Uh, those of you uh, who might be familiar with the Northern Gulf of Mexico, that one spot up near Louisiana, that's about the exact spot of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So obviously tarpon spawning didn't happen that year. Other places, you know, offshore, once they get into deeper water, um, uh, that's when they uh, do their spawning. It's typically around the pool, sometimes around the new moon. We don't have any data yet on spawning locations in the Caribbean or the extent that they might uh, be spawning farther north of Florida, but I'm, sort, I'm certain that they are on the East Coast at some point during the summer. So these are graphs, let me walk you through them here, of uh, satellite tags can reward depth. You can see depth here on this axis. It's in meters, uh, so uh, meters below the surface, just multiply that times three, and that'll give you approximate feet. And the color um, is uh, the temperature of the water. So the, the uh, hotter the color, the reds, the warmer, and the colder, the greens and the blue, uh, the, those colors are colder. So you can see these, these tarpon are good. They, these fish are offshore and they do some pretty deep dives down to uh, about 350 feet. This one's around a full moon in June. This is a full moon in July. These offshore dives down to about 300 feet. Uh, these are three different uh, fish doing, or, or excuse me, six different fish doing these dives. Um, and you can see that it's pretty consistent um, getting down to at least 300 feet, um, sometimes even deeper, and typically around those moons. So why do we think this is a spawning behavior? Well, bonefish are closely related to tarpon um, because of the larvae. So when these fish go offshore and spawn, they do what's called broadcast spawning, where they're in groups. Um, it's not like they uh, build a red or a nest like uh, salmon or bass. Um, they broadcast spawns. So they eject eggs and sperm into the open water um, and that's where fertilization occurs. And then the, the, uh, the adults, that's it, they're done, they go back in shore. After about a day, 24 hours, uh, the eggs hatch and this is what comes out called leptocephalus. It's a type of larvae that's very eel-like. The tarpon are related to eels, um, ladyfish, uh, the bonefish, which all have this same larval form, which they've had for uh, tens of millions of years. And for tarpon, 
Um, this is what they look like for about a month um, while they're out getting swept around by the ocean currents. Bonefish uh, the same way. So this is a track. Um, again, this is depth on this side. It's in meters, so multiply times three. Um, and again, the color is the temperature. You can see the depth. This is a tag that was in a bonefish. We also had side scan sonar. You can see this is our track here. This is a school of bonefish near the surface at eight meters, so about 25 feet. Um, and then at, at some point at night, this is around the full moon, they do uh, some pretty significant dives, getting down to about uh, uh, 350 feet or so. Um, and it's in this area that, uh, again, as with the tarpon, um, they stay at that depth, uh, get very deep, uh, and then they do this uh, very fast vertical rush, and we think that's when the spawning happens. Uh, and in the uh, bonefish track, we've also had them on um, uh, on the depth finder as well, you can see the school of bonefish. It's probably about uh, six to 8,000 bonefish. And as I said, this is a bonefish larvae. You can see it's very similar uh, to the tarpon larvae. Um, and we think that they're spawning at these depths to deposit the larvae uh, at those depths because um, the difference in water temperature that's very sudden that you can see here um, at around 300 feet causes a change in the density of the water. It's less dense or lighter on the above 300 feet and more dense below. And we think that that allows those larvae to stay at that depth, uh, which is a good feeding area for them. Um, so the offshore spawning uh, for both of these species is very important. So those larvae that I just described, um, these arrows show some approximations of the currents that, that sweep the larvae from the spawning spots uh, to um, the juvenile habitats. And you can see a lot of connectivity here. So we're talking here about it's all our it's all of ours fishery, um, and they're connected in two ways. One is with the larvae. And we a colleague actually did a study where they captured larvae over here in central Florida near Cape Canaveral, and looked at the age of those larvae. Uh, all fish have uh, ear bones called otoliths, and they have growth rings in them. And for young fish, they have a growth ring every day. For old fish, it's once a year. So they could look at those growth rings of the larvae that they caught of tarpon and backtrack how old they were. They're about 30 days. And then uh, look at the ocean currents and they figured out that those fish were probably spawned right here. Um, this is Tampa. So they're spawned off of Tampa about 120 miles. Um, so there's like that connectivity. And a lot of the spawning that occurs down in South Florida um, ends up, uh, some of you may have seen juvenile tarpon in Georgia, South Carolina, and even North Carolina. Uh, that's probably where they're coming from. This is what a juvenile tarpon looks like when it's changing from that larval form um, into a baby, what we would recognize as a baby tarpon. It's still clear. And they're looking for backwater uh, mangrove or marsh swamps, basically as far as you can get in a kayak. And then you get out of your kayak and you walk even farther and you get up to that muddy, mucky, your neck deep of mud, mosquito infested um, swamp pond. And, and that's where those juveniles start. Um, this guy is probably about six months old, and that's the type of place that we caught it. Um, so there's connectivity from offshore inshore habitats as well for these fish. As they grow, they start to use uh, larger mangrove and marsh creeks, um, like this mangrove creek uh, here from, this one is from uh, Mexico, actually. Um, and then we also think about adult migrations a lot. Now I'm going to focus on that because um, that's what everybody is interested in, the adult migration. Um, and that typically occurs after uh, spawning occurs, one of the migrations. So we're using acoustic tracking. This is an acoustic tag, the size that we use uh, for tarpon. Um, they have a battery, uh, a small uh, computer. Uh, they send out supersonic pings uh, that are coded. Uh, and, and the codes uh, basically uh, identify the tag with an individual ID number. Those pings are detected by underwater acoustic receivers, as you see here, that are anchored on the bottom or sometimes on floats near the surface. So if you're in open ocean and the, swim, and the tarpon swims within you know, a kilometer or so of, of these uh, receivers, they get detected. This is the picture of uh, Luke um, surgically implanting the tags. Uh, once we catch a fish, we put it in the sling. Um, to keep us safe and the fish safe too, in case there's sharks around, we can handle it better make an incision in their in their abdomen and we stick that tag into the abdominal cavity 
them and send them on their way. And this tag will send out pings every couple of minutes uh, for the next uh, five or six years or so. so. We can track fish, the same individual fish over many years. So it's not just us, uh, our group that has acoustic receivers. Um, we have uh, over a hundred in um, South Florida, but colleagues are using the same technology to study everything from sharks to rays, redfish, triple tail, you name it, cobia. And so they've got acoustic receivers. You see all these um, dots are all different studies. They're not different receivers, they're different studies, which may have you know a dozen of these detection devices, or they may have many hundreds. And so if our fish, even if we tag it down here in the lower keys, if it swims up the coast, it's getting detected by all these other receivers that our colleagues have. And that allows us to track the fish um, over space. And we all share data. If we pick up their fish, we share that data with them and then they share when they pick up our fish. So look, put this graph together. It just kind of gives you as the crow flies, uh, uh, migration or uh, seasonal migration tracks of uh, many of the tarpon that have been picked up. And you can see the connection between the Keys uh, and South Florida all the way up uh, through Delaware most recently. Um, and these aren't all the individual tracks are just kind of representation of the type of connectivity that we've got. So as Mason said, that they showed you different states have, have uh, different regulations on tarpon. If you go to Louisiana, for example, a uh, tarpon's not even listed in their fisheries book. So there's no regulation at all. Um, some states are good. Florida is catch and release only, unless you have a trophy tag. Uh, Texas, you have to catch a fish larger than the current state record, which essentially means that, and every time that there's a new state record that's caught and kept, uh, the minimum size again increases. So it's essentially catch and release. North Carolina uh, made a tarpon catch and release. South Carolina and Georgia are, are getting better regulations, et cetera. So protecting the fish in that respect is obviously important because we're all sharing those fish. Um, this shows you some of the connections just on uh, the Atlantic side. I took out the Gulf of Mexico for this one uh, because I'm going to start zooming in here given that our concentration is, is in North Carolina. You can see here on the right, um, these are individual fish. You can see the ID numbers and then each color uh, for the different fish. Um, and a lot of these fish, since we've had them tagged for multiple years, some of them are making the same run, say up to uh, Chesapeake Bay every year. Some of them are making a run, say to South Carolina one year and then not that far, or maybe to North Carolina the next. So there's some individual variation as well. So let me walk you through this a little bit complicated graph here. On this axis on the left side is latitude. Um, so all the way down here at, at 24 degrees uh, and change is uh, South Florida, the Florida Keys. And that's in blue. You can see here the states are in different numbers, uh, colors. We get up into North Carolina, um, and that's when we're in the green, South Carolina, North Carolina in the greens, and then all the way up to, to Virginia and even Maryland. And on the bottom uh, axis here is the month. Um, and you can see this very distinct seasonality um, during the summer months. It's something that we've noticed by talking to anglers who fished for tarpon, say in South Carolina, Georgia, um, and some of you have been doing it farther north for a while. Um, we're starting to, to see a possible shift earlier in the year to that northern migration. Uh, rather than waiting to say July, uh, people are seeing fish you know, farther north uh, all the way in June. And I'll, I'll show you some more data on that. But you can see again here, this repeated uh, connectivity um, from the Florida Keys all the way up as far as Maryland and back. And for those of you in North Carolina, um, you know, you've got fish that are part of that migration uh, every year. Some of them bypass you, but a lot of them, as you know, if you fish for them, um, come into your sounds and estuaries. So another thing that we can, we can tell by these detections is uh, on the acoustic receivers, is depending on where the receivers are, we can figure out the type of habitat the fish is using. So over here on the left side is a number of detections that a fish um, has uh, been recorded at the various receivers. And on this axis on the bottom, each of these numbers is an individual fish identification. Number. If it's orange, that means the fish was detected in the estuary, say in Albemarle Sound. The blue means detections uh, along the coast, 
And a lot of colleagues have acoustic receivers all along the coast as well. And you can see a couple things here. One is that they use both inshore and, and a coastal habitats. And some fish seem to mostly stay or entirely stay out on the coast. Some use the sound a little bit and others seem to spend a lot of time in the sound. We do have some real interesting data on this particular fish that shows some pretty specific movements um, within uh, North Carolina estuaries. But I am going to show that you guys watching that I am an angler, I am a fisherman, and I'm not going to show you that data here in a public forum because it's specific enough that you would be able to uh, figure out some likely locations and time of year to fish for them. And since my guess is that some of you on this call have probably figured that on, out on your own, I'm not going to um, spoil your secret, um, and at least not in this public forum. So your, your secret's safe with us. And that's one really important thing is we're doing this research to contribute to conservation. We're not doing this research to satisfy fishermen's curiosity or help to catch more fish. It's very important to realize that. So we share the information that's appropriate to conservation. And if we get information either from fishermen or guides or from these tagging data that will be more specific to fishing, um, we don't share it um, because that's not our job um, to show people where to catch fish. That's the angler job and the guide's job. So seasonality, kind of jumping back on this, and these are detections of fish that I just showed you in both the coast and in the estuaries. Again, the number of detections, and this is by month. So you can see there's definitely that uh, mid-late summer peak, um, but you can see that there's some fish nowadays getting detected in May, these number of detections in June as well. Um, and down here in Florida, even over the past, say 20 years, we've seen a shift. Um, in Southwest Florida, a lot of you guys have heard of Book Grand in the past. The season used to start in mid-May, um, but now uh, frequently it'll, it'll start in good numbers of fish in early April. So that's one of the uh, likely uh, influences of climate change. And then, of course, you see this fall off um, or decline in, in, the, in the fall, the autumn, um, with those first cold fronts that come through. Uh, and those of you that fish the coast know that the tarpon are putting on the feed bag uh, with the migrations of uh, mullet, menhaden, and um, alewives, and everything else that they can um, chomp on uh, during this time of year as they head south. So a little bit of specifics. This is as specific as I'm going to get on locations is these are the locations of receivers where these fish color-coded were detected. Now that doesn't mean that the fish weren't also in these other areas that are blank. It means that there weren't necessarily receivers there uh, to pick them up. So we can see a lot of movements, but we can't see all the movements. There's still gaps, um, but we get enough information that we can uh, push for management, not just catch and release regulations like Mason was talking about, but also habitat information. So with that as kind of the, the overview, then why does it matter for conservation? What are the conservation threats? Well, uh, in other places, Central America, South America, Caribbean Sea, uh, the harvest isn't as high in most places as it was, but in the 70s it was very high, many tons of tarpon harvest a year. And in South America, uh, particularly Brazil, there's still a, a good amount of the harvest uh, commercially. Uh, along the South American coast. And those fish are not migrating, uh, as far as we can tell, no data shows they're migrating up, up to our neck of the woods. But when they spawn, their larvae do get transported um, up here to some extent, so that remains a concern. Catch and release mortality uh, is also a concern, um, and that gets a lot into education, anglers knowing how to handle the fish, fight the fish so that it's landed quickly, uh, those types of things, if sharks show up, um, you know, swallow your, your pride and put the rod away and, and go somewhere else where the sharks aren't. The shark predation, uh, depending on the location, can be a, a, a pretty major issue. Juvenile habitat loss is a huge conservation threat, probably the biggest. And as climate change occurs, we'll talk about this a little more in a second, um, and juvenile tarpon might be able to survive winters farther north, uh, marsh protections in South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, maybe even Virginia might become important for, for juvenile tarpon uh, survival. So if the water temperature stays above uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, tarpon should be able to survive. Drops below that, that's kind of their, their lethal minimum. 
So as, as uh, winters become warmer, it becomes more and more likely that those larvae, they get swept up into the estuaries uh, up in uh, the North Carolina, as an example, can start surviving those winters. And if that's the case, then protecting the juvenile habitats in North Carolina is also gonna become something that we have to look into. Uh, because it may well be that places, say in South Florida, uh, become too hot uh, due to climate change. Freshwater flow alterations into the estuaries is huge. In places where we found that freshwater flow into marshes, for example, is altered or becomes lower quality, uh, we find slower growth rates of juvenile fish, um, big time, uh, and even some mortalities. <clears throat> so the quality of the habitat. Um, and as you can see in the picture on the right, um, this is a school of uh, Menhaden along the coast, uh, forage fish declines. Some of you may be involved in some of the work on trying to reduce the harvest of Menhaden, uh, particularly off of Virginia. Um, but uh, around the coast, both the East Coast uh, and the Gulf of Mexico, overharvest of Menhaden and other species that tarpon depend on uh, is, a, is a big issue for us. So if we can demonstrate that the tarpon uh, throughout the region are depending on Menhaden as far north as Virginia, that gives us more leverage uh, for working on those issues as well. Climate change effects is a big one. Um, I already talked about how the seasonality of adult migrations uh, might change. Uh, they might uh, move north sooner. They might stay longer. If they stay longer and they're up, say, in Albemarle Sound, and all of a sudden a super strong cold front comes through and the temperature drops too rapidly, that can actually cause a mortality event. Um, uh, they also might start going uh, farther north. As there, the tarpon seasonality might change. Uh, we have to wonder what the seasonality of what they eat, like the forage fish, how that might change. Well, menhaden start to be more northern uh, of a northern fish uh, rather than say mid-Atlantic uh, and southeast coast. Some of you may know, for example, that um, another game fish, striped bass, uh, are now becoming uh, very common up as far as Miramichi, which is Atlantic salmon, historically Atlantic salmon habitat. And that's because of, of climate change. So we're seeing those types of shifts already. And we're trying to figure out um, how to adjust conservation. Broader geographic range, as I said, um, we've actually had some reports past couple of summers of tarpon being caught in Persane nets uh, as far north as uh, New Jersey. Um, I already talked about new juvenile habitats and inadequate juvenile habitats if habitats continue to be lost, the marsh habitats continue to be lost in those northern areas. Well, that could be really problematic. So I can't give a talk without a so what, I mean, what can you do? Uh, one is become an advocate. Um, if it's not already there, um, push for catch and release status in your state, even if they have some regulations like the minimum size, other than a trophy, there's really no reason to keep a tarpon. Um, they don't taste very good. Uh, <clears throat> so real, no real need for them unless you're protein deprived. Um, so that's a good one at the state level. Juvenile habitat protection, restoration. Um, look, if you like uh, redfish, for example, they use similar marsh habitats as juveniles. Um, so marshes are extremely important, even if you're not fishing for them, uh, fishing for tarpon in those habitats. Freshwater flow management, I've already talked about. Um, right now, as an example, the low country in South Carolina um, is in pretty good shape, but looking at the long-term development, development plans for upland of the low country, they're gonna have some freshwater uh, management issues for sure because a lot of that freshwater flow is gonna be stopped from coming into the estuary, which is a problem. Water quality, um, algae blooms, those types of things can be an issue. Um, forage fish management, I've already talked about. Um, if you're an angler and you're not involved in uh, the Menhaden Coalition, um, please look into getting involved in the Menhaden Coalition. The more voices, the better. Another big one on our own plate as anglers is education. Learn the proper catch and release practices. Uh, BTT uh, has a, uh, on our, under our education banner, we have uh, best practices for tarpon catch and release. Please learn them and practice them and, and show others um, how to do it. Uh, make sure your state agencies know about it so they can distribute the information as well. One of the things, huge things is on um, tarpon catch and release is if the fish is over 40 inches long, don't remove it from the water. Um, removing a big tarpon from the water increases mortality after you release it tremendously, even if it swims away when you let it go. And educating others is huge. Even if they don't fish for tarpon, let them know the importance of the tarpon to us, to the economy, to the ecology, and everything else. 
Uh, and of course, join groups like Bonefish Tarpon Trust, uh, NCMEF, uh, and others that advocate for the fish in their habitats. Um, squeaky wheels get the grease, and so we have to let people know this is, this is important. And then I'll end with, um, I've already mentioned it a little bit, uh, we have every three years, uh, we have a symposium um, in South Florida. Uh, this year, it's November 12th and 13th. Uh, it's two days, uh, a combination of science presentations that are ongoing from eight to five every day. A lot of panel discussions about the research and how it applies to fishing, how it applies to uh, conservation. Uh, but there's also um, an entire venue, kind of like a, a mini uh, fishing expo, fly fishing expo, uh, with all kinds of, of companies and fishing guides and others who were there interested in the fishery as well. So it's a, it's a pretty tremendous weekend. And then most people tag on a fishing trip before or after or both. This symposium. And so with that, um, I'll wrap it up and uh, we can take any questions. Dr. Adams, thank you. That was an incredible presentation. And I certainly came away with a lot of stuff I didn't know. So I imagine a lot of others did as well. Um, and we do have a few questions and I know we're running short of time. So I do want to try and present these to you and Luke. Um, I'm not sure which one I wants to take this, but um, so the first question, um, how long has BTT used acoustic trackers? Go for it, Luke. Right, so this tarpon project uh, started in 2016. Uh, prior to that, we initiated a permit study down in the Florida Keys. And the ability to track these fish over multiple years uh, made it obvious choice to expand a tarpon. And as more and more researchers are expanding their own acoustic receiver networks where we can share this data, it just became an obvious leap. So yeah, now we're going on to the fifth year for this TARPON project. Wow. Well, thanks, Luke. Um, second question, it's, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's similar, but it's in the same ballpark. Um, as climate change continues to affect and change migration habits of TARPON and other fish, is there a need for an increase in acoustic trackers along the Atlantic seaboard and the Gulf of Mexico region? Definitely. Uh, one of the big, biggest issues with recreational fisheries, especially those people that are on this call today, probably all love, is we are really data poor. Uh, we have very little data. And so acoustic telemetry now offers a unique insight into recreational fisheries. And acoustic telemetry is going to be a very important tool uh, to measure those climatic effects. And also uh, tapping into angler knowledge is really important as well. Uh, I'll be providing a survey in the link in a momentarily. And that sort of gauges how these migrations have changed over decade, decades of time. Yeah, good, good question. Awesome. Thanks, Luke. And Dr. Adams, thank you as well. Um, you know, I guess I wrap things up. Um, everyone who stayed on and is still on and everyone who attended before they hopped off here. Thank you so much for, you know, hearing our presentation. Um, again, I hope you came away with this with some knowledge you didn't have previously. And, and it was, you know, the webinar was uh, everything that you thought it might be. Um, again, if there's any questions you didn't um, that weren't answered or that you might come up afterwards, feel free to reach out uh, to me and uh, I'm, I'm certain uh, Dr. Adams and, and Luke probably wouldn't, wouldn't care if you reached out to them as well, if there's anything they covered. Um, obviously, a lot of the, the tracking um, questions and acoustic related stuff, you might want to defer to Dr. Adams. Um, but, you know, on behalf of BTT and the North Carolina Marine Estuary Foundation, thank you all so much for hopping on. I uh, really enjoyed this opportunity. Thanks, everyone who made this come together and everyone uh, enjoy the rest of your week and Take care.